Welcome, 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 everybody. How are you doing? David here with this week's Briscoe stream. Got a full house today. We've even got Mr. Leck joining us in just a second. Um, and we're going to be joined by Common Sense Skeptic to talk a little bit about Elon Musk and his many, many strains. And in some places, maybe fraudulent um, companies, uh, really looking forward to that. Um, but before we get started, I did want to, we're going to be doing more about this next week, obviously. Um, but I did want to start out by just briefly touching on the Supreme Court decision that came out uh, today. Um, the Supreme Court, if you didn't see, ruled against organized labor um, in a pretty damning and dangerous uh, ruling uh, today. The case was about um, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, um, a local affiliate of them, um, who were sued by their uh, their company for when they were on strike action leaving concrete in some of the vehicles owned by the corporation the corporation has been trying to sue these workers and this labor union for damages and in an eight to one decision the supreme court ruled with corporate power here really dangerous ruling because i think it's important to understand exactly what's at stake and what we're talking about because the headline obviously is that the supreme court is ruling against labor the specifics of it are why it's so dangerous, because it's not just about the right to strike. That isn't even what was on the docket. Um, the right here is the right of corporations, allegedly, to be able to sue workers for damages to property and damages to their profits that they suffer during a labor dispute. This is massive because this means what's the whole point of a strike? The whole point of a strike is to punish the bosses and the people at the top of the corporation um, so seriously that they have to come and listen to your demands as the people who do the work and do the labor. The Supreme Court making this decision is a direct affront, a direct threat to that right. Because if you go and strike for three months and Amazon loses a couple billion dollars to then be able to argue in court, look, the Supreme Court said that workers are liable for the damages um, done while they are on strike. It's a really dark moment. Um, and remember, this isn't new. Uh, in the Warrior Met uh, coal case um, in Alabama, uh, one of the very frustrating things was that the NLRB was aligning itself with Warrior Met, um, the, the coal company, in saying and accepting some of the estimates of damages from this corporation that, again, was starving um, its workers because it didn't want to return to a pre- um, crisis pay scale for the workers, despite the fact that it was incredibly profitable. Just a, another example of how dangerous the Supreme Court is, as it is currently co constituted, and as um, and just in general. Remember, this was eight to one, so of course all of the Trump guys voted against these workers, but also d so did the Obama appointees as well. If anything, if you've been watching this program, you know that the Supreme Court is a direct threat to working people, a direct threat to democracy. And it's beyond time, I think, for people who have been too cowardly to say that we shouldn't be living under a system where nine unelected people basically get to sit on top of society and rule and act in the interests of the rich and powerful. Um, you know, all those people who have been afraid to say we need to do something about the court. This kind of thing is only going to get worse over the next few years. So we'll have more uh, coming on that in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I want to make sure that we talked about it because it's a really damning ruling. And also, I think a lot of people didn't understand what is exactly at stake here in that corporations being having the ability to sue striking workers uh, for their activities. But without uh, further ado, I think it's time to get to the main event. And we're going to be talking about none other um, than Elon Musk. As I say, oftentimes, sometimes I feel like Elon Musk has been personally trolling me. Um, his move to Austin has been really damaging to people in the Austin area, not a, not the least of which the workers here. Um, we had Gus Bova on recently uh, to talk about uh, a worker who died building the Tesla Cybertruck facility, um, you know, just about 10 minutes down the road from me um, here. Um, and I think most of this audience already knows just how <laughs> dangerous of a, of a leader and a boss uh, Elon Musk is. Um, but I think it's also important to look at, like, it'd be bad enough if all of these people were sort of being ground down, um, you know, by some tech wizard. 
the thing about Musk is he creates tremendous suffering for his corporations and the payoffs are very, very limited. Like I wouldn't take that deal in the first place. Don't get me wrong. Um, but this guy is, is, you know, doing a lot of nasty stuff to people for very little, um, except in most cases to stroke his own ego. Um, but without further ado, let's bring on, um, the common sense skeptic, uh, the common sense skeptic runs a YouTube channel of the same name. Uh, you should definitely check out those videos. I believe there's links below, um, for people to check it out if they haven't. Uh, thank you so much for joining us CSS. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, really happy to do this. We've been talking about for a little bit. And of course, coming out from the shadows, Mr. Matt Leck, my fearless co-host joining me this week for a Grisco stream. How are you doing brother? I'm doing very well. Happy to have the majority report release delayed a little bit uh, today, just so I could be here for uh, this discussion. <laughs> I'm, I, I, thank you so much, Matt, for taking the time. Well, of course. Um, for folks too, by the way, as you know, these are usually more interactive. Uh, we're going to be talking for a bit on Musk. So if you have questions or points that you'd like to make, uh, feel free to do those in the chat and we'll try to get to some of those as we go. Of course, uh, we appreciate all versions, but very much we appreciate Super Chats if you're able to. Um, but anyways, friend, I mean, I know there's so much to get to, so we shouldn't dilly-dally too much. Um, I was thinking we could maybe sort of walk through some of these these companies, which you've investigated and debunked um, in depth. And I think maybe we should start um, with SpaceX, most notably his uh, um, Starship, uh, which blew up very recently um, over South Texas. There was a lot like the response to that from Musk and his, <laughs> his big fans is pretty funny. Um, basically, instead of seeing something like that as like a pretty big failure, um, I mean, what, what did they call it again? An unintended, uh, would you remind me? An RUD. <laughs> RUD. Rapid unscheduled disassembly. <laughs> so beautiful. Hilarious. I mean, this sort of comedy, that and the let this sink in, you know, just it's like uh, uh, Richard Pryor's back with us. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you know, what were the claims that were coming out of that for Musk and his people um, uh, uh, around the launch and just the people on the outside who support him so much? And, you know, what were some of the things that sort of struck you that like maybe the public wasn't getting the full extent of uh, what happened down um, in, in, in South Texas that day? Yeah, we, we just put out a video. Um, it's about an hour long, I guess, where we literally went point by point through that entire launch and kind of went against what the uh, announcer was saying at the time. But the there was supposed to be a mission, right? The thing's supposed to take off from South Texas and fly across the Atlantic and fly across, I think it was Africa, and, and eventually wind up off the coast of Hawaii. And that was the, the mission. That's what it was supposed to do. But then you have the commentators towards the end of it when they know the thing's about to, to go, saying, oh, yeah, no, anything after clearing the tower is icing on the cake. And it's like, no, that wasn't the mission. The mission was supposed to be this. And even at, you know, with, with what they had planned, they weren't going to be recovering the booster. They weren't going to be recovering Starship. Um, you know, they were just going to plop them down in the water. Uh, as it turns out, it looks like the, the wreck actually managed to land in uh, Mexican domestic waters. Um, judging from the, I think it was the NLAA weather satellites. It's actually south of the U.S.-Mexico border. If, uh, if you see where the green blob is uh, on the on the video frame that we used, so then about a week after the launch, Musk does a Twitter Spaces, and we did another hour-long video on that, where Musk is going through the uh, the, the way everything kind of coalesced over the launch, and. What it comes down to is him saying that this version of that machine was basically Frankenstein together. It was unmatched Raptors and it was bad hydraulics and it was this and it was that. And basically they just launched that to get it off the pad and into the water so they can move on booster, I think it's nine and, uh, and Starship 25, I think is the next one that they're planning on going with. So the FAA, being the licensing agency, if they had any clue that that's how this ship was being uh, assembled and the parts that they were using being so mismatched and so inappropriate, um, that I think is going to play a huge role 
in the federal case that has been brought against the FAA as the licensing agency. So, I mean, with that, I mean, um, you know, with the, with the government oversight and over, in oversight of, of, of this, I mean, when it comes to FAA, I mean, is it that they're, in your opinion, that they're being misled or do you think that they're, they're not really investigating this, um, uh, you know, closely enough before launch? I mean, um, uh, you know, what, what, What's the reason, for example, that they're able to get away with 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 some of these things when it comes to government regulation of of the of SpaceX? Well, the federal lawsuit that's being brought against the FAA in uh, District of Columbia um, outlines how the FAA um, abdicated their responsibility in writing the DPEA uh, to SpaceX. So SpaceX was allowed to write this document that the FAA was supposed to be writing, and they came up with a font ROD, which says a finding of no significant impact saying on paper that the explosion and negative effects from a starship would be no different than it would be for a Falcon 9 doing a supply mission to the ISS like that site was supposed to be doing, right? Of course, it's going to be different, but the FAA handed it over to SpaceX. They said, you write this document. Three uh, SpaceX employees and a guy from an infrastructure company um, teamed up to, to write up that document. And then they handed it over to the FAA. The FAA signed off on it. And now the FAA is in trouble. Man. Yeah, I mean, it's it, like, I mean, we'll get into some of the other companies. Um, but like, in addition to like Musk being able to take advantage, for example, of things like low interest rates to sort of run these debt printed companies for so long, a big part of, of Musk's, I think, um, ability to sort of fuck up this badly across the board has been that the U.S. government seems to be very much asleep at the wheel uh, when it comes to uh, to his many different companies. I mean, could you tell people a little bit? Because I think some people also are, are are not as clear on this. This isn't just money. Like what Musk is doing with SpaceX in general isn't just money that's coming out of his own pocket, right? Um, well, none of it's coming out of his pocket. He put in the the original hundred million or whatever it was to get the the Falcon prototypes done uh, way back in the beginning. But he has to do funding rounds about every three to six months to raise another billion dollars to, to keep the lights on. Like SpaceX is, is dependent on the venture capitalists and, the, and these funding rounds. And anybody who thinks they're not is just not paying attention. You know, he gets compared to, to Bezos a lot and Bezos takes a lot of heat. But Bezos actually does take a billion dollars of Amazon stock every year to finance Blue Origin. And Musk doesn't do that. He's using your money. He's using NASA's money. He's using taxpayers' money. And all of it, um, you know, everybody thinks it's coming out of his pocket, but none of it is. Yeah. And I mean, like, this brings up uh, another, <laughs> you know, associated company here, which is Starlink, right? Yeah. Um, the, the the satellite Wi-Fi corporation. And um, if, if correct me if I'm remembering this wrong, but I remember, you know, he was doing, he, he does this every once in a while, but like particularly at the beginning of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you know, he just tweets out, um, you know, Starlink is on in Ukraine. And like, there's questions about like how you have to actually set up that system um, in the first place. But he then turns around, you know, a few months later and basically starts demanding that the United States government or the Ukrainian government themselves start paying him for the service that he, you know, got, got lauded for basically as this benevolent and kind um, billionaire who's looking out for people. Oh, he took all sorts of positive free press over that. But the fact of the matter is uh, the U.S. government, I think it was France and Poland, there's two other foreign companies or countries anyway, um, were buying the Starlink dishes off of him in the beginning for three times retail for the discontinued round dishes. So it's war profiteering on Musk's behalf. And then he, you know, like everybody thinks that he's doing this out of the, the goodness of his heart. No, it's a business deal. And mm -hmm. like you said, you know, a couple months later, he's like, well, we can't afford to keep um, keep this system running. Because what people don't realize is that Starlink is not an internet provider. It's an internet rebroadcaster, right? Like they're, they're third party. So they have to pay the, the data rate at whatever ground station the signal is coming to. And in the, in the Ukraine, uh, there's one ground station uh, primarily that's picking it up and it's in Poland. So whatever Poland is charging Starlink for the data rate, that's a charge that people, it, it doesn't even come to their mind. They don't even think about that, but they have to pay that. So that's what Musk is saying. I can't afford 
to, I can't afford my utility bill for this, so I'm going to pull it, right? Richest man in the world, la, 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 he can't afford his utility bill. You yeah. know, before, sorry, David, I just want to uh, back up uh, Common Sense Skeptic because I love your channel and you, but I want to address one part of it, which is that there's a lot of must content on there. And for me, that's like, that's awesome. For some person, they say like, oh, you're obsessed with Elon Musk. I'm curious what your sort of history is, particularly like in like the skeptic uh, sort of circles, which is a, you know, where I, I was a big you know, skeptics guy of the universe fan like 15 years ago. I'm curious, like your history with Elon Musk, because I remember back in the Obama administration, it was like, oh, this this billionaire uh, uh, is like doing electric cars, generally supportive of that. Um, and I also support the government making investments into things. Uh, didn't really understand that that half a tr or third of a trillion dollar investment into Tesla would kind of create this monster um, a little bit. But I'm just curious what your sort of a history is with Elon. Um, uh, being honest, he didn't really come onto our radar until um, until COVID hit. Like when we had no intentions of starting up any sort of channel or anything like that. But COVID hits, everybody is you know homebound. And we're, we're having these debates online over and over again with people. And, uh, you know, a, a news story would come out. And one of us would say to the other one, you know, like, Musk said this, and that doesn't sound right. You know, why doesn't it sound right? Well, let's work out the math. So we, we got to the point where we were so strong in the arguments that we thought rather than having the same argument over and over again on Facebook or on Twitter, mm -hmm. let's just make a video and we'll, we'll nail everything down. We'll do the math and we'll show everybody this. And anytime that somebody says something stupid, we'll show them the video. And that was July of 2020 is when we uh, released our first one. So we're coming up on our third anniversary. But the uh, early on, like the, the electric cars, great. You know, everybody's, everybody's for green energy, if it is green energy, right? right. And that's not really the way that, works out after the numbers are run anyway. Um, private access to space, fantastic. You know, let, let's figure out how to get our guys back up into space without using the Russians. So with, if you're looking at those two things on the face value, then yeah, you, you want to support that because why not? You know, that both of them sound like great ideas, but then you run the numbers on batteries or you run, you know, the numbers on Starship. And it was our first episodes were on Starship because there was just no physical way for Starship to possibly do what Musk was saying he was going to do. So the very first one was the, the rocket design. That's July 1st, I think, 2020 is when that one came out. So like, we started off as fans or, or at least not skeptics of him and taking all of the mainstream news at face value, how they were reporting him. He's a genius. He's doing rockets. He's doing electric cars. He's, you know, he, he's the next Einstein, whatever. Um, but then pedo guys, you know, th that, that kind of stuff comes up. You go, right. okay, if this guy was really that smart, he wouldn't say something so stupid. And once there's a, forgive the term, chink in the armor, then y y you have to pry it apart, right? Mm -hmm. We're sitting here homebound during COVID and we got nothing else going on. So the brain starts picking away at all these different stuff. And, and there's always dirt. Like people say, yeah, you got a lot of must content. Yeah, I do. And, you know, the, uh, you go into the, the space hotels and we've done crypto and we did a three part series on Kevin O'Leary, but mm -hmm. Musk is the, the golden goose. You know, he's the gift that keeps on giving because he's always doing something stupid. <laughs> yeah. Right? Doing, yeah. saying, being something stupid. So you know, if there people go, okay, well, why don't you why don't you dig into Blue Origin? Well, Blue Origin's not making stupid claims. They're not saying million people on Mars by 2050. They're not saying they're going to land an upright cigar tube on the on the moon. They're not saying they're going to figure out orbital refilling in the next past year, right? Like that was supposed to be done 2022. They probably haven't even started working on the nozzles that they got paid 13 million dollars for. But Blue Origin is in a lot of cases what people think spacex is right it's financed by the billionaire so bezos he doesn't have to be as public he doesn't have to be as bombastic because he is uh mm -hmm. he's financing everything on his own right there's two very small investors in blue origin there's nasa's now given them the bigger contract for the second moon lander but up until that point you know 
Bezos had only taken millions of dollars from the U.S. Space Force and from NASA. That was it. Musk has to rely on the bombacity to keep raising the funds every three to six months to keep the goddamn doors open. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, like this is the I mean, we've been covering Musk both on, on Left Reckoning, but even back in the day on the Michael Brooks show for, you know, for years now. And I think one moment that was a bit of a turning point for some people. Um, you know, because cards and tables, like I'm a socialist, so like I generally don't trust billionaires in general. Um, but I think one moment publicly that was a, a kind of turning point in sort of breaking the cult around Elon Musk was when those children were stuck in the cave in Southeast Asia and Musk just decides this God, is yeah. our submarine. And then when they said we don't really need this, you know, he accused the divers who ended up saving those kids of being pedophiles. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And, and it's amazing, like, how much, because whenever he does these things, he gets just the most incredible press. And I think it's starting to wane a little bit with with Twitter, which in, in, in some ways does sort of annoy me that it took, I don't know, like the place where people hang out and post memes and stuff online to be the, the thing that infuriated the general public. But whatever. Um, well, that, no, that's the thing, you know, just to jump in here, Musk gets all the positive press when he says that he's going to help people out in a, in a crisis because never waste a good crisis, but he never gets the backlash when he fails to follow through with it. So the pedo guy submarine, that was one thing. Um, the Flint water situation, that was another thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Puerto Rican, uh, power, uh, he was, he was going to supply Puerto Rico with, uh, with solar power. Um, you know, he couldn't get that working, but well, very few uh, agencies were recovering that. Um, and the ventilators for COVID, right? Um, Giga yeah. Buffalo was supposed to be uh, pumping out these ventilators that they're going to make out of old spare Tesla parts. And he, he didn't, he didn't get, uh, you know, torn apart for, for that kind of stuff. So he, he uses these issues as vehicles to impress investors by performing yep. the impresario. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I'm glad that that's sort of been my impression of Musk. Like you say, even more than Bezos, he's like performing for investors yep. as much as embodying the tech genius. Yeah. Yeah. And yet when you, when you break down the, the genius claim, you don't have to go any further than Hyperloop to know that the guy's just a brain dead moron. <laughs> <laughs> and and like uh sort of afraid of people <laughs> like i can't get over <laughs> the, the like his discussion of public transportation and like uh, his aversion to it uh like he's howard hughes or something and he's determining and getting invited by localities and that's what really offends me especially is when like you know this mayor brings in elon say like oh maybe we could do a hyperloop here and that stuff has got to end so uh, you remember when uh, this is three or four years ago, I guess now, when his uh, his tunnel traffic system was supposed to be, you know, the, the next big thing, right? And he got this video of the car pulling up into the parking spot, and this little um, it, it comes onto the the skate, and the skate drops down by elevator, and all of a sudden you're into this freaking network of tunnels going every which way, right? Nobody ever explained the limitations on that system. The first one being the number of skates in that system. Where are they getting parked at one end? And if there's no skate in the parking spot, when you need to go down the elevator, you can't get down the elevator. And then you've got uh, all of these uh, tunnels that are running in parallel with each other, you know, going every which way underground because you know, hollow earth. Um, <laughs> and, and nobody explains how you're going to get from one tunnel to the other tunnel so you can actually get where the hell you're going, right? Like it, it's just really simple shit that people can't... Uh, they don't have the intelligence or the wherewithal or or I think maybe even the confidence to question these things. I think and I think especially when it comes to politics, he gets like a lot of space on that. Like, you know, just like two examples with the tun tunnel idea, which is, you know, ludicrous on its face and like even the best conditions. You know, he's been sort of shopping that around my neck of the woods. Um, he got some deal in Kyle, Texas, uh, which is a small town just south of Austin you know, to build one of these tunnels to help them build some level of more walkability and, and public transportation in, you know, in this small town. It wasn't like a massive contract, um, but they went up against like some real people who were going to build like a legitimate train system or a bridge system in, in, in the city to help like, you know, pedestrians get around. Well, of course, here comes the boring company, which wants to, you know, play big in, in, in Texas, their new home. And they show up, they underbid all of the competition, they get the contract, and then when the city said, hey, could y'all give us a feasibility study on this? They get um, ghosted. 
they ghosted him. They disappeared off the face of the earth. You know, yeah. another example is another one of these stupid loops that they proposed to do in San Antonio, Texas, um, where they desperately need something like that to connect the downtown to like the, the airport system. And he again promotes this stupid ass um, loop idea um, and beats out um, other companies that were going to do a more traditional like air train. Um, and well, yeah, you know, the, California was looking at doing rapid uh, transit from LA to San Francisco or whatever it was like they, they had a plan in place for doing rail and Musk didn't want them doing rail. So he jumps in with, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to build this hyperloop thing. And now you got both of them, both of them, neither one of them happened. Right. So both of them are in the shitter. Um, the, the, the costs that would have been associated with doing the, the rail transit, those have skyrocketed since. It probably cost double the contract now that they, they had originally planned had they actually done it 10 years ago. So I want to um, jump back in. So, you know, because we only have a limited amount of time. I want to get to some of the other companies like Neuralink and Tesla in a second. But you know, before we move on, I mean, I know it's like a broad topic. We talk a lot, for example, about like the environmental and the political damage of SpaceX here in, in South Texas, but is there anything else that you'd like to direct the listeners to? And for people, um, you know, who this is the first time they're coming across common sense skeptic, really check out the YouTube channel. I was really enjoying jumping into, uh, you know, all of those, those videos the other day. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're very detailed, but like, you know, if there's any kind of big things that you think people should understand about either SpaceX or, or Starlink that you don't think, is even getting into the the heads of people who might be sort of suspicious of, of Musk in general. Well, one of the things that I'd really like to, to bring attention to, and it's a concern of all of ours, is the environmental damage that's being done at a very important point in, um, in North America. Um, like we do the videos and we, and we talk about the turtle beaches and we talk about the birds and all the rest of it. And people are like, who cares about turtles? Who cares about birds? He's trying to get us to Mars. Well, here's the thing. Boca Chica, not only is it a crap location for orbital launches anyway, because you've got like a two degree azimuth that you can aim for between Florida and Cuba. So, you know, the, the, the wide array of azimuths that you have from Kennedy, you, you can't do that from, from Boca Chica. But Boca Chica is the southern tap in the U.S. for what's called the Central Migratory Corridor. And these are all the birds that fly from everywhere in North America to everywhere in South America. The, you know, the, the birds that you see in the summer don't live there in the winter, they fly down this corridor, right? They nest in this area. And if, if they don't have that nesting, if they don't have that corridor, what's going to happen to them? Well, with the piping plover, for example, their population is down 53%, I think is the number, um, in, in that area, right? And this is an endangered species. The, the wreck that they had uh, on April 20th, not only did the thing wreck, it also started up a brush fire that covered three and a half acres, right? And it's burning all of these uh, birds' nests on the ground because they're ground nesting birds, right? So there's pictures of these nests that are just burned right out, right? And w considering how, um, how strong environmental laws are in the U.S., it, it's amazing that he's allowed to get away with absolutely any of this because not only is... Not only do you have the Turtle Beach in the east, you've got a, a state park to the northeast. You've got another park to the north and northwest. Then you've got um, a, manage, a wildlife management area throughout the south, right? So you're in between and, and right in the middle of about five different protected nature zones that were there and pre-established before Musk moved in. And people will say, well, you know, around Kennedy, you know, they have all these uh, nature preserves around there too. Yes, but Kennedy bought the island, made what they needed to, and then turned the rest of it into a nature preserve. Mm -hmm. And and th those are th those are apples and oranges. Like, there's no comparison there. Kennedy went out of their way to make a nature preserve, and Musk is going out of his way to destroy it. Yeah, and I mean, uh, before we move on to, I mean, I, I remember you noting this in, in, in one of your videos after re reacting to the, ex you know, <laughs> the rapid uh, unscheduled disassembly. Um, was that, uh, you know, all of this um, particle 
par- particulate particulate Fall, yeah. yeah falls after uh, after the storm and i remember um reaching out to some of my friends and, and journalist co- colleagues who are in that area you know them sending me you know just incredibly horrific pictures of what they were experiencing there and i think yeah. musk said something along the line of the uh, along the lines of like this is no different from like a dust storm yeah um, it's like, but- he, he called that a human uh, a human created sandstorm no the the <laughs> The Fondag cement is, I forget the, the chemical on it. It's aluminum, it's aluminum and, uh, okay, just had a brain fart. But anyway, it's a material that you don't want mixing into your local environment, yeah. right? It's a, it's a material that if you breathe, it's, it's damaging to your lungs. Uh, and that's not just our lungs. That's, you know, that's bird lungs. That's cat lungs. It's every other animal in that area that's endangered lungs. Um, plus, if you're mixing this, um, this chemical into into your uh, uh, the algal flats, for example, there's going to be a negative impact there. And if you're mixing it into the vegetation, there's going to be an impact there. And if it's hitting the water in the fresh water that they drink, it's going to have an impact there. So, you know, it, it's it would be so easy for him to do things properly, and he just refuses to do it. And the reason why, and people ask this. Why doesn't he just have a, a flame trench and a flame diverter and a, and a water deluge system? And the answer is really simple. Musk doesn't want to deal with the Army Corps of Engineers. Mm. He has to deal with them to make this happen. So what he's suggesting in, in its place is this milk stool that didn't work with the shit. And then um, because it destroyed it so completely, now he's going to try this metal steel plate that's water cooled. And that's basically, and we said this in the, in the last video, that's his not a water deluge system, right? Because if it's a water deluge system, he's got to go through the AOC. But mm-hmm. if it's a, not a water deluge system, like it's not a flamethrower or not a launch tower, like the launch towers that, that he's got there uh, was never approved. There's never, there's no p- permits for that at all. It can be taken down by the FAA anytime they want because there is no permits, but they haven't stepped up. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 next level stuff. Um, well, let's let's move over to the big one, if if you don't mind. Let's talk a little sure. bit about Tesla. Sure. Um, you know, because that that is why for a lot of people why he's so uh, famous, and you know, for his defenders, he is like the one who is saving the earth um, by pursuing, um, you know, this the electric cars. <laughs> um, you know, these things have been just riddled um, with issues. I mean, one thing that I think is really notable, um, especially early on, is I think there was always a, a big discrepancy in the way that Tesla was sort of viewed um, versus the, like the amount of vehicles it was actually producing, um, yeah. <laughs> um, which, I, you know, I think really, really harmed. Uh, I was I really, you know, confused a lot of people because the way people would talk about Tesla, you would think that almost every vehicle in, in the United States was slowly being replaced by a Tesla, you know, small, small, small fraction of that. Um, but on top of that, I mean, there's th- this really dangerous stuff, particularly with the AI, um, the self-driving vehicles, um, which have already cost people's people their lives and one thing that is really striking to me across the board with musk is it seems like he's not even really listening to a lot of his engineers um in in the process of building these vehicles yeah well that's across the board you know that that's obviously Neuralink. we call all the original founders from Neuralink quit Mm -hmm. um you know that's a spacex because tom mueller retired and then he immediately started up his own space program um or a rocket program, not space program. I guess there is a difference. Um, but yeah, you know, Musk figures he knows all. Yeah, you know, like he knows more about manufacturing than any person on Earth. It's like, oh, if you could get slapped through the computer, buddy, you would have been. <laughs> but yeah, you know, he makes all these these grandiose claims, and and you know from the news articles, from the people who are brave enough to to speak up, that if you say anything that contradicts anything he says you're fired on the spot and that's all there is to it and you can't even go to court because he signed a freaking argument where he controls the arbitrators so you know and christina ballen that would be a perfect example there you know a brilliant engineer uh, pretty much solely responsible for curing some of the biggest ticks in the model s and the battery packs i think it was the model s that she worked on her initials are engraved into the the battery cover in a in a little um hieroglyphic right that's how important she was mm-hmm. to getting that 
uh, all taken care of. And as soon as she spoke up about some things that she was seeing about the factory and some safety concerns that she had, she got fired. She got accused of um, not theft, but um, embezzlement, um, destroyed a reputation as an engineer. And the, the girl still can't get a job in the industry because Musk just had an absolute heyday embarrassing this woman publicly, right? And being, basically, if you're working at Tesla, you, you've got to be able to keep your mouth shut. And well, honestly, if you're working at Tesla or SpaceX right now, quit while you can still take some sort of prestige out of having that on your resume, because eventually that's going to change. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> can we talk a little bit about some of the, the the design issues with these vehicles? I mean, one thing we've made fun of a lot on this program were those uh, the, the yoke steering wheel. Yeah, I want oh. to, but but I also want you to address. So there's one thing I've sort of like dialed back, which is the criticism of exploding Teslas, mm -hmm. because I get a lot of Tesla fans come and say, you know, uh, actually they explode uh, uh, this percentage less than combustion engines, and to me that's not so impressive because combustion engines, like yeah, that's literally using explosions uh, right. as a motive force. Um, but I'm just curious, like where you came down on the exploding uh, Teslas thing, and also let's talk about the yoke too after that. And did you see the music video that we just put out a couple days ago? I did. I yeah. didn't know. <laughs> I, I cut um, about seventy different um, Tesla fires together and put it underneath uh, Prodigy's fire starter. Oh great! There's oh, I no saw that thumbnail. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that was that was just something that uh, that I got to do while everybody else is off doing their other stuff. But um, the, the the fact of the matter is, even if um, they were a similar percentage, let's say the same number of Teslas per capita are blowing up as you know compared to to uh, ICE vehicles. A nice vehicle on fire is going to be out in an hour. It's going to be cleared in three. If a battery-powered EV catches fire, that sucker's burning 16 hours now and another eight hours in a day or two, and it's destroying everything around it. You can't move it out of, the, out of your garage because, you know, the, the power is gone, right? You, you, you can't even drag the damn thing back because you can't, you can't get close enough to it. If a Tesla catches fire, it's burning to the ground, period. Right. And mm -hmm. it's going to take three or four times the amount of water just to cool the area. You're not ever putting out the fire with water. Right. It's just to cool the area. You're, you're using like three or four times the amount of water that you're using on a freaking house fire. Right. You're, you're talking 17, 18, 20 engines worth of water if there's no hydrant nearby. And basically, you're not putting it out anyway. Just let the goddamn thing burn to the ground and be done with it. And don't don't take the 16 or 20,000 gallons of water, whatever it is that, that they're quoting and, and pollute all that water with the lithium and the byproducts that's going to wind up in the storm drain and into your local watershed. Hmm. Yeah. And I can't help but think of that sort of the intensity of the burn, like you say, when you see the hyperloop images and it's yeah. like, well, what happens if one of these things like smashes against the wall and starts exploding? Like it, it, Vegas loop. It, in Vegas Loop, it, that's bound to happen. And that's actually the video where you caught wind of us, I think, um, mm -hmm. back in 2021 when we only had like 6,000 subscribers or something like that, right? That's when we did the, the Loop uh, video. But right. we walked through, um, there's a reporter that actually videotaped the entire Loop, right? So they went all the way around. So we went frame by frame through that looking for um, emergency measures, looking for sprinkler systems, looking for escape staircases, um, none of it. There, there's like a fire extinguisher, typical handheld fire extinguisher at the, you know, right by the uh, entrance to the tunnel at the only underground terminal. Um, but we weren't seeing uh, even, uh, you know, exit signs this way or or arrows pointing or, you know, anything on, on the, the floor, there, nothing on the walls. So you take a look at some of these fires and the way that they've gone up, and you can imagine that happening in the middle like of one of these uh, tunnel segments, depending on which way the wind's blowing. Uh, if there's no wind, then the, the smoke's going to catch people from both ends. And if, it, if it's going one way, then you, know, you better be running the other way. Right? But I didn't see any safety measures in these tunnels at all. And eventually, 
like you said, uh, one of these is going to catch fire in a tunnel. When that happens, it's going to be a disaster. And you, you, you're just hoping that the death count isn't that high. Because I don't even know if the tunnels are wide enough for people to get out of the cars if they stall mm -hmm. there. They don't look it. And as you say, like that smoke is going to go one direction. What if you're on the wrong side of the vehicle? Right. Like you're just going to die in smoke inhalation. Yep. And, and it is toxic smoke. It's like hydrochloric acid and you know, it, it, it's not going to end well for you. You'll die quickly, I guess, but right. that's about the, <laughs> the only hey, it's a feature. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like, there's an aspect to a lot of these, these vehicles too, where it's just like, you know, it's hard to be, you know, cliche, but like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you've ever tried to get into a Tesla, you know, I mean, maybe I'm goofy or whatever, but I have the hardest time <laughs> opening up those doors, right? Because yeah. it doesn't make intuitive sense. Um, and then inside, they, instead of having, you know, multiple things that you can manipulate to open up the door or to put up the window, they have one button and it reacts to the way that you press it. <laughs> yeah. And I've been, I've been experiencing more and more like rideshare drivers, I think, buying these vehicles because they think that, you know, they'll be saving money on gas um probably you know something that's a little bit outside of your price range um in, in in general and they're just riddled with these kind of fundamental bizarre avoidable issues and because they are all powered uh systems if the the vehicle loses power you know if, if your if your battery catches fire you're going to lose power that's pretty much the way it goes and if it, if it does lose power you can't use those door latches to get out of the out of the car <laughs> plus people trying to pull you out of the car from the outside can't because those are electrically controlled as well. So you have to be able to find the hidden manual releases in the doors if the vehicle has them. And the Model 3 in the back seat, for example, doesn't have these manual Jesus latches. Christ. Right. So if you've got if you've got two parents in the front, two kids in the back, and the car catches fire, if the parents are able to get out of the car, they're not able to open the doors and pull their kids out from the back seat. Like, well, I mean, I'll, I'll never personally ever get into a Tesla, period. But what if what if you just have a ball bearing you can throw against the glass and uh, then you can get <laughs> out that way? That worked really well for Cybertruck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there was a there was somebody who was a Musk fan, you know, a Tesla customer um, complaining to Musk about the sentry mode, um, which is like it's defense against, you know, carjackers or whatever. <laughs> Going off, well, he went into the store, didn't, forgot to turn it off, and his child and wife were in the vehicle. And, you know, it just went off and it blares this loud sound. It locks you in the vehicle. Um, you know, and it's like, it's funny, but like, it must have been extremely traumatic because the, the child, and it would be traumatic to anybody, by the way, but like the child had, um, you know, autism. So it was like having, you know, a severe, you know, mental episode in, in the vehicle as this thing is just like blaring sound. And it's just like, why that, you know, like, it, all of these kind of features are they're just not built for reality they're built for like the constant concept set sketches for musk to feel like he's living 40 50 years in the future and st and you know in reality what you get are these highly dangerous um and buggy vehicles that just on the regular are are, are causing trouble for people for their yeah, users absolutely yeah and that's not even going into things like build quality and panel yeah. alignment and that kind of stuff right the roofs that fly off because you're going down the the highway too fast or their back bumpers that get ripped off because they go through a one inch deep rain puddle you know it, when when tesla came uh, into being from the original founders and so many people don't even realize that musk wasn't an original founder at, at tesla but their idea was to build a high quality it was going to be expensive but a high quality sports car that was completely reliable and uh it, and they, they had a completely different vision for how the company was going to expand and whatnot. And uh, Eberhardt was the, the CEO at the time. And he's the guy who came up with the idea when he saw a Porsche parked next to a Prius <laughs> is where he actually came up with this, you know, uh, this mental image of an electric sports car. And him and his partner had made quite a bit of money selling um, electric e-readers, right? The rocket book. Mm. Mm -hmm. So they sold that to, uh, to TD Guide, and they made a bunch of money there. And then they put their money into, into Tesla and got it off the ground. Uh, so it was their experience with lithium batteries that kind of moved um, what was the, uh, the EV propulsion uh, lead acid batteries into, into lithium, right, to, to make that transition. That's where that 
brainchild came from. And then Musk joined on as a, an investor in the Series A round. Um, but Musk wasn't there at the at the beginning. So the you know the original um, the impetus in the company, he had nothing to do with whatsoever. But once he once Eberhardt started getting all the media attention, Musk couldn't handle that. So he drove Eberhardt out of the damn company that he created and the, you know, ripped him off from the, the product that he you know, literally uh, envisioned. So it, it, it's really hard to take a look at, at what's coming off of the Model 3 lines and compare that in any way to the original Roadster. Mm -hmm. right? And the... The platforms that are out there that are successful, right, um, all basically come off of the Roadster Skate, the original one. And everything that's come after that, that hasn't been able to, to get to mass production, the Roadster 2, the Cybertruck, you know, anything else coming off the line that's been promised five years ago and still is five years away. <laughs> he doesn't have that, that core knowledge from the beginning to, to move that into the next phase, Right. So mm -hmm. he, he's running into trouble. And it's the same thing at, at, um, at SpaceX. Right. When he was developing the Falcon and the Dragon, he had Tom Mueller and Tom was the rocket genius. And Tom Mueller doesn't like Starship. You know, he, he actually has this. Um, I don't know if you saw the, the Blue Origin uh, frame that went uh, went to court. It, list all the complexities of trying to get Starship to the moon at 16 launches and it's this amount of time in between refills and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, Tom Mueller retweeted that, you know, so uh, after, after he left SpaceX. So Musk comes into a company thinking that he knows everything, but the people who actually know anything are gone, mm. right? And Neuralink's going to be the exact same way because Musk came in with a, I think there's seven or eight other founders at Neuralink. Uh, all of them PhDs or you know masters of their own domain. And Musk, the know nothing, comes in with his money and says, "Well, I want to be you know the chairman of the board." So he comes in and starts you know laying down what he thinks things are going to happen. And they're all like, "You know what? Even though our names are on the patents of the of the robot that you're going to use, we're out of here because we mm -hmm. can't handle you anymore, right?" And it, it, it's just it, it, his pattern is so easy to spot, and yet so few people are actually seeing it. More and more now, but you know, it, it takes a lot of awareness to to get those types of messages out. And and unfortunately, I think that like there's more awareness now, but I don't find it to be like I don't know, like deeply ingrained, if that it's makes sense. Not prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so before we move on to some of these other things, and then at the end, I'd like to talk about Musk just more broadly as a, as a character. Cause like, obviously, you know, all these things touch, go through one guy, which is why all these companies have these issues. But while we're still on Tesla, there's two things I was wanting to talk to you about. One is like build quality. And the other is like the, the self-driving and like the build quality of the, of the Teslas is, is, is very low. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that, you know, in, in the decades coming, we're going to see um, a lot of old Teslas on the road still because they're they very much like follow kind of like the iPhone model, right? Mm -hmm. Of uh, you know a new release every little every few years, um, and then the ones that are already out there, um, you know, it becomes very hard to repair them or to keep them on on the road. Um, Try replacing a battery, see what a battery costs you, and that's why we think there there's never going to be. Oh, sorry, looks like the dogs are gonna. Oh, no worries. Um, <laughs> that's why we don't think there's going to be classic Teslas because <laughs> you, you take a $30,000, $40,000 car, right? And five years from now, you got to put in a $20,000 battery. You're just going to do what the guy from the hydraulics channel did and make money off of YouTube blowing that thing up in a, in a gravel quarry. I mean, that was freaking fantastic, right? It's like, no, this, this is what I think you got. Right? So... But no, uh, but you add the battery issues to the build quality and uh, and the propensity for them to catch fire, and yeah, like in twenty twenty eight, you probably won't see a twenty twenty two or a twenty twenty one Tesla anywhere because the batteries worn out or things caught fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know like typically too, like mo most ac accidents, like they'll just total the Tesla. Um, you don't even have to do that too much to a Tesla to total it, though. Like as soon as you nick that battery pack, car's done. It's a write-off, right? Yeah. 
And then, I mean, um, you know, the other thing too that is just so wild to me about, uh, you know, one of the big innovations of, of Tesla is to take something physical like a vehicle, right? That you think you sort of own outright. And then to, because it's so software driven, <laughs> right. to put all these restrictions on it after you own it, right? Like Matt and I played a few videos of people being like, having to pay for an update literal like literally like what they do with video games DLC. <laughs> well anybody who spent any amount of money buying beta software should get their head examined right <laughs> and and the having beta software on public streets is a public menace mm -hmm. oh yeah i mean that's one of the thing we can't absolutely stand and like and maybe i'm wrong but to me when i hear beta like i know um uh, motherboard manufacturers when they release something beta like this happened recently with asus and uh ryzen motherboards that's kind of a, a code word for like we might not want to cover this under warranty if something goes wrong i don't know if that's what the deal with the you know, the um tesla stuff but i do know there's that recent um recall that a lot of the tesla folks were like it's actually not a recall they just had to uh do a over their air update for everybody and when you actually look into why they had to do it is because they were screwing around with the uh regenerative braking thing in a way that was counterintuitive with folks and forced them to opt into it so it's like yep. yeah that sounds like a recall to me yep <laughs> you did something you messed it up now you got to fix it that's a recall yep. it doesn't matter if it's software or physical right yeah and um i mean before we move on um last thing is like you know the self-driving stuff as, as we've been sort of touching on i mean it's incredible uh, to me that this is uh, on the road right now um, because of the failures that we've seen. I remember the New York Times did like a, you know, an in-depth uh, report on it. And in, in the piece, they basically went to like a Tesla super fan in Florida who's like, I'm so happy to be able to drive this around. Um, and, you know, I thought, you know, just judging by like the, the headline where it was, I thought this was going to be another puff piece for tesla but in it like these are supporters of, of this program being like yeah i get scared a lot and they have video of them trying to take a left turn that's very difficult um you know for a normal human being to do let alone a machine um and the machine obviously was unable to do it and it almost got them into an accident the driver had to take control at the last second it's really frightening to think that that's you know driving around um i mean i live right next to one of the showrooms and for funny reasons they can't sell them here but like i see a lot more teslas in austin um than, than i would like and yeah. it makes me very uncomfortable <laughs> when i see them knowing um one you know if they are using this that they they might be driving erratically um or two knowing the kinds of people <laughs> who are buying teslas in austin you know that they might not be the most aware and might really buy into the idea that yeah yeah i can watch it you know i can watch netflix while i'm speeding down i-35 and that's uh, a heavy car yeah, the basic question that we've got about FSD is who the hell asked for this? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. If you have this in your car, you're driving down the highway, you got to keep your hands on the, the steering wheel anyway. And it's kind of like letting your three year old drive, right? Where you have to, like, it's just more anxiety on a normal drive than what you would have if you're just driving your goddamn car. If you don't want to drive, take the bus. <laughs> right. But but these people who feel the need to play video games while they're getting from point A to point B in the in you know, basically a lethal weapon, if the thing goes off the rails, um, who asked for this? If, 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 if the vehicle's not going to perform as a robo taxi, and let's be honest, it never will, then you don't need FSD. Mm -hmm. You know, this is billions of dollars in research spinning wheels that really, at the end of the day, who gives a shit? Right, your 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 car is not going to go out and make you thirty four thousand dollars a year or whatever it is that the Musk said it, it was going to. Because if everybody did that, what's the market? Seriously, <laughs> right? Like, does nobody at Tesla or SpaceX run numbers? Because the numbers that we run, it doesn't take advanced math degrees, but boy, can we blast holes in this stuff pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and then I mean, um, you know. <laughs> Last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say on this before we move on too is that, you know, they're not the first people to sort of investigate or be interested in this kind of te technology potentially. What is unique about Musk is his willingness to put this on the roads before it's proven and safe. And his um, willingness to lie about it. Yes. Um, 
Well, I mean, I want to like, because I don't want us to run out of time. I want us to talk more broadly about Musk in just one second. But I mean, like, I think one of the most draconian, like one of the nastiest companies that he runs um, has to be Neuralink. Um, yeah. It's frightening in like, it's frightening in like the world that he like promises to people to me, generally, I, I'll, I'll admit. Um, but also like in what it's practically doing. I mean, the torture of those those animals. Um, I mean, could you talk a little bit about Neuralink, um, Musk's grandiose claims um, about it? I know you did a really great video sort of breaking it down because it really, truly, out of all of his companies, I think is one that people know the least about, um, but it's probably one of the more horrifying ones. Well, the, the stat that people should know right off the bat is that, um, according to reports, 1,500 animals have died at Neuralink. Not all the monkeys. Some of them are rats. Some of them are sheep. Whatever. It's 1,500 animals that have been tortured to death, getting holes drilled into their brains. Uh, for something that, mall, that Musk thinks you're going to be able to go to a mall kiosk in 10 years and have one of these installed in 15 minutes. This is open brain surgery, you freaking idiot, right? <laughs> Once air hits the brain, you're never the same. This is a, a, a credo of, of brain surgeons. And, it, it, okay, let, let's say you've got this uh, dollar coin sized thing sticking out the top of your head. And it is going to be sticking out the top of your head because it doesn't match the width of your skull plate. And that skull plate is gone, right? Like they're, they're going to drill a hole out of your skull and they're going to throw away that bone and they're going to replace it with this electronics. It's got inductive battery uh, charging uh, requirements. So what happens when you charge up a battery inductively? It heats up. A hot spot on your brain, um, it, oh, that, that can cause a heat stroke, right? Yeah. And even if it's only two or three degrees, it doesn't take much for you to be out in the sun for you to stroke out because of heat, right? So if you've got a hot spot on the top of your head, um, that's going to three, four degrees higher, then it's going to it, it's going to sizzle your brain a little bit, right? It's at least going to dry out the area. And if that battery leaks directly into your cranial, cranial cavity, you're history, right? So they're not putting any serious thought into any of this. And one of the reasons why I think most of the people at Neuralink who founded the company have left is because of Musk's insistence that rather than being... Um, uh, the rather than giving paraplegics, for example, the ability to control their hands with their mind, right, which is something that has been done for 20 years, right, uh, in, in various labs is not mainstream, but it's, you know, it is something that's been worked out by like uh, Nic um, Nicolaelis, uh, Miguel Nicolaelis, which is where uh, Max Hodak, who used to be the president of the company, got his training, like the, the whole the whole monkey eating the banana slurpee while playing a video game is a direct ripoff of a Nicolaelis experiment that was done 20 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. rather than rather than that being good enough, no, Musk has to turn this thing into the fucking matrix, right? Where you're going to be able to download, you know, kung fu and the French language and the ability to play a guitar directly into your head. No. You have, if, if that's what you think, you've got no idea where those centers are in your brain, nor the accessibility of 1,024 microwires at the top of your head to reach those centers. You know, most of them are at the center of your brain, right? Mm -hmm. You want this robot sewing microfilaments into the center of your brain? Hell no, right? I don't even want to do it on, on the top of my brain, right? Because <laughs> I, I'm never going to get that piece of skull back. Even if I have okay. this thing taken out, what are you going to cover the freaking hole with? Yeah. I mean, just get guitar right. tabs online. This would be my <laughs> guess. <laughs> right? <laughs> or, yeah, quit being so goddamn lazy. Pick up a book or pick up a guitar. Right? I mean, um, you know, but the claims, too, are, are, are really, really wild. Um, you know, like, one, his claim that, like, they'll be able to do it at one point, like, at a mall kiosk. Yeah. Um, but, like, like getting your ears pierced or LASIK surgery. Yeah, you just go to Claire's and get a nice nose ring and the right. fucking poison you your in your brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, just make sure that your uh, that your Neuralink device and stuff so it matches your jewelry. But yeah, like, but the, there's out there too, right? Like the digital immortality, being able to download your memories or download your consciousness to put into a, a golem, right? What is that going to look like? Who has to die? for you to install your consciousness into that body because we're not making fake bodies yet, right? This isn't Picard. So it's just the, the general lack of thought that goes into it. And 
for for that video that we did, there's like 12 or 13 people all sat around in the semicircle, and every single one of them was smarter than Musk, who was sat at the center. But he was the only one speaking for the most part. Mm. Right. And, and all these other people are nodding along, like Max Hodak. He's got his degrees in, in neurology and neuroscience or whatever it is that he's got. And he sat right next to him and he's silent. Right. He's just like Santa's helper. But he was supposed to be the president of the company. When the CEO of the company was actually Jared Birchall, who's a real slime bag. Uh, and he's must plant in Neuralink. He was kind of like cracking the whip on everybody. And the, the guy's a failed banker. Right. He, he doesn't know jack shit about neurology, but he's trying to tell these PhDs and vets and all the rest of it what they're supposed to be doing. Mm. He's garbage. Yeah. And I mean, um, it's what's the what's the status um, in terms of, of, of human testing? I, I could be wrong, but I, I heard that there were some openings so, for them. So the understanding we have is that Neuralink has made the announcement and the FDA has not uh, made a any sort of announcement confirming that they've acknowledged that Neuralink has made the announcement, but they haven't said, yes, that's actually what we agree to. That's our understanding of where it sits at this point. And honestly, if they can't keep monkeys alive, then the only people yeah. who should be volunteering for this procedure are the diehard muskrats. <laughs> well, yeah, come um, on, Ron DeSantis, uh, do it for the presidential campaign. Come on, buddy. <laughs> If you're under the impression that uh, a lobotomy is going to make you smarter, you're probably right. It might make <laughs> DeSantis more personal. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, in the last couple of minutes, um, you know, we didn't even do Twitter. And it's it's not that I'm uninterested in that, obviously. I just feel Wait, like there's so much on I'm not it really that... on the time crunch here if you guys want to go long. Yeah. I got to go, um, actually, um, and cool. finish uh, my other job. But uh, Skeptic is great uh, talking with you, man. And folks, um, I'll just say, what, you're going to say it at the end, but go uh, subscribe to his channel um, for this stuff because I really appreciate the uh, the uh, attention to detail you guys do over there. So uh, uh, great to be with you guys. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but just, you know, in closing, I mean, you know, the, the thing about this is that, for better, for worse, like we see like the failures in his companies, but Musk has been very good at creating a kind of public persona around himself. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he's been able to take advantage of particular parts of like the American economy, for example, like low interest rates, the tech boom, bubble, etc. Well, especially um, grants. The, the guy's a welfare queen. Yeah. Right. If, if there's a green grant out there, he'll make a suggestion that he's got some sort of product coming up that's going to tap into that. So he gets that money. I mean, if it wasn't for government funding, he, the guy you wouldn't know his name. Yeah, I think that I think that's that's true. And I, I mean, generally, I mean, just like maybe in closing, if you could give us your your general thoughts on 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 Musk and you know what he may, might represent or why you think he's particularly dangerous. Like, I'll just say that you know, for me, like on top of all of his his failures, one thing that is really frustrating to me about Musk is that is the way that he's been able to own in the kind of public pop imagination the future. Right. And I think a lot of the excitement around him comes from like, oh, this guy is this, you know, brilliant, but maybe a little odd inventor, you know, who's going to bring us into the future. And all the people criticizing him are just jealous, angry or are invested, you know, in, in, in competing companies. I also think it's undoubtable, too, that so many of the people who are his diehard fans also have a lot of money tied up mm -hmm. in his companies. Um, and his companies, for the most part, don't produce enough, right? Like Tesla doesn't produce enough to be considered like one of the biggest car companies in the world, right? But it has a massive, um, you know, valuation. Um, so what does that mean? It means that he, his companies are very sensitive to public perception. Um, but I'm curious what you think after, you know, spending so much time looking into all of his different companies and the guy himself. Well, the best way to describe Musk and his followers is cult. Yeah. Like it, it, it comes down to 90% of the world is sheep, 10% are leaders. They need someone to, to follow, and Musk is that, right? In the absence of uh, religion or somebody more worthwhile, then they, they glom on to who the mainstream media is calling a, a genius. Uh, and you know they, they can point to certain uh, specific examples of, of things that they think he's done when he actually hasn't had anything to, to do with those particular products, uh, especially in their initial concept or development. And uh, yeah, a lot of it comes down to, and uh, kind of touched on this before, people right now either don't have the intelligence or confidence to stand up. We get told a lot of times that you can't 
criticize rocket engineers because you aren't one. Mm -hmm. Fuck off. Seriously. <laughs> yes, we can, because we can show you using addition and multiplication why the claim is garbage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that's the whole premise of the channel. We don't go into what our education is, none of it. Like, there's no personal details, and that's why we've got the avatar up here. It doesn't matter who we are. We're showing the people who follow our channel how to think for themselves, how to take a claim that doesn't sound right to you and make it sound right or completely dispel it. And it, it's easy to do. People just don't do it. It's easier to follow along with the crowd. And like you said, there's a lot of his followers have got a lot of money tied up into his companies and they keep following him and they keep pumping it because at this point they're into a sunk cost policy. They, they either uh, need to average down or they need to break even or, you know, a, a lot of it doesn't, if you've ever um, taken a look at the, uh, the initial quality surveys, for example, uh, for a Tesla, they are not well built. They're in the basement of the ratings. If there's 26 um, brands that are being investigated, they rank no higher than 23rd. Um, and this is the, the initial number of complaints per vehicle right off the lot, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, that's with, and that's just with the stories they can get their hands on because Tesla suppresses a lot of that information. And with Tesla insurance, you can bet that that information is not making its way all the way back to the reporting agencies and the, and the higher brokers, right? Because you've got, um, you know, different levels of, uh, in, in insurance companies for who's doing what, right? So if, if Tesla can suppress information, they will, because I mean, that's just what Musk does, right? He, he claims he's transparent, but because he's claiming transparency, you know, he's not right. It, 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 it's kind of, it, it's just the way that he operates, but I think that in the very short term and in the next two or three years, uh, we're going to see uh, uh, probably a collapse of the house of cards and it might even start with the Dogecoin suit. Right? Oh yeah. We have that here. If people want, <laughs> yeah. Like they, th that Rico suit is a $258 billion class action Rico action, right? In, mm. in civil court, it could have gone criminal, but you know, uh, Musk doesn't have $258 billion. Musk no. probably doesn't have $10 billion that he could liquidate in a week, right? Because so much of his Tesla is tied up in, um, in being leveraged against his other investments. And now that Twitter's worth a third of what he paid for it, I mean, how far underwater is he just on Twitter? Yeah, and like, I mean, I think that's another thing too that you, you note in a lot of your videos and it's important is that he uses these companies like against each other or he, like he, he uses some of these companies or institutions to to fuel other operations in a way that is, is pretty incredible. Yeah, well, it, before he w uh, started in on Twitter, half of his Tesla holdings was already leveraged. That's according to um, uh, the magazine that keeps track of the billionaires. What the hell's the name of it? Brain fart. Anyway, um, he he already had a high leverage position, and and being being that he had to sell as much Tesla as he did, that position only went up. So um, I would be very surprised if he's not fifteen twenty billion dollars underwater with Tesla right now, mm -hmm. plus paying a billion dollars a year in interest <laughs> on the loans that he took out. Right when he can't pay rent in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, everybody, if you want more of that, uh, you should definitely be checking out the uh, Common Sense Skeptics YouTube channel. There's a link below in the show notes. Um, it's a really excellent channel. Um, you should definitely be subscribing and, and and keeping up to date with what they're doing. I mean, they do other stuff too, like Crypto Glad. <laughs> we saw that scam as well. It's pretty. It's a pretty uh, incredible world out there right now, friend. Yeah, there, there's so much for for people. To, they're exposed to, to so many different things. They're supposed to be the next great thing, and everybody wants in on it. And you have to realize that if you're not in at the beginning, then you're going to be left holding it at the end. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking some time and joining us today. Fantastic. Thanks for having me on. Of course. All right, folks. Um, appreciate all of y'all. We'll be back this Sunday with the bonus episode. Next week, we have Alex Hochuli on the program, uh, the host of the Bunga Cast, as well as the author of The End of the End of History. Really looking forward to that. So see you all on Tuesday, and everyone have a good weekend, and take care.